And thus far, we finished chapter one and chapter two, where you did some really simple programming using you know, the strings and numbers for the last two assignments or so. So today we'll look at chapter three is um, a, a complete chapter covering the decisions. So the decision in this case is that diamond shape we have been looking at in your flow chart, okay? And let me also open this note here. We'll take a look at that in a minute. So right here, we see the float chart. Again, this is from chapter three. So in the figure five, you can see that this is something we already kind of discussed before. Um, three symbols here are very common. You will use a lot in your program. So the first one is this rectangular or squared symbol, which usually is a task symbol, right? Where you, you process information, you will use that. So it has to be a square or rectangular. Well, in other words, before the four uh, corners or angles has to be 90 degrees, right? As opposed to this one here, this shape here is commonly known as a parallelogram, although that's completely debatable because both of these are in the, actually all of these are parallelograms, right? So, so we say the slanted sides. This symbol here used, um, is used for input and output. Okay, so uh, if you've seen that in my comments to you and your assignments, so um, just be aware that these mean different things, okay? And then the diamond symbol here is the condition or the uh, decision structure. Um, this one it did not show the input, but there should be exactly one input coming in, like you see down here, and then exactly two output here, but or we call it branches, but only one of these branches will run, okay? Never both and never none. It has to be one uh, branch, must run. Okay, so these symbols are used a lot in, in programming, and you'll be writing a lot of these as well. So here's another example here. <clears throat> now we put some information into these boxes, and you see that we test a condition in the diamond shape, then that will always result in a true or false branch, and then we you know, follow the flow of lo flow line. So data, I mean, program always flows in one line. You cannot do both at the same time, on the right side is a pseudocode that will kind of tell you what it looks like using the if and else statements. And then this is another example where it shows you you have a multiple choices or multiple branches or sometimes alternative branches. Okay, so you have choices, choice one, two, and three, but you cannot, you know, have all the choices in the same symbol. So you have to run each choice separately as you go down. Again, choice one then if choice one is true in this case, then you will follow the true branch over here. You process something in the true branch and then you continue on your exit out. Okay, if choice, if choice one is not true, then you follow the false branch and then you check for choice two and so on, okay? And this is a, um, a multiple uh, or if statements or sometimes it's called the nested statements. That's what we'll see a little bit later. So on the right side is two ways how you can actually structure this using Python. Okay, again, this is still kind of pseudocode because this is not actual code, uh, right? Python doesn't let you use the bracket like this. I'm just putting it here. So it looks very similar to Python code. This is still a pseudocode. So you can do it this approach. As you can see, the code is like um, going deeper and deeper or further, further out to the right as opposed to on the very far right, everything is like straight down. Okay, so I mentioned last time that one of the um, principles of Zen is flat is better, right? So you don't want nested because it's really hard to read um, and it's hard to debug as well. So <clears throat> that's that, and then down here, you must also make sure you understand this truth tables, okay? When we use uh, and and or and not, the operators here for compound conditions, right? So when you test two or more conditions, um, you will always result, they will always result in a true or false value. Um, so again, just an example saying that the value for A is true, the value for B is true. If A and B, then the and means that both has to be true, right? So in this case, you see that all these are false because both A and B are not true. So again, at the end symbol, and the or, um, or operator and the not operator here, okay? So the not is actually very simple. You, it's basically the inverse of 
whatever this value is. If you not A, then you change the true to false and vice versa. So this is a very uh, useful approach method or method to construct a program that uh, behaves like a light switch, right? You turn on and off. Uh, that will be you basically you not the value, value every time it will turn on and off that way as you go. And, and we, again, we'll do this later. We'll see how this is being used in a loop um, later. Okay. Down here is another example, a little bit more uh, practical, I guess, is um, this program here shows you how long it would take you to travel, um, you know, from one place to another based on a uh, rush hour, right? For example, you cross the Bay Bridge, I guess the Bay Bridge would be somewhere in San Francisco, and is, are you traveling during rush hour or not, right? Um, and then, or, or I guess, are you traveling via the Bay Bridge? If you do not travel by the Bay Bridge, then you go to the no, no or the false branch, and then your travel time will be about 45 minutes. If you do travel through the Bay Bridge, then it goes to the yes branch, and then it asks you another prompt here, is this during rush hour or not, right? Rush hours, I guess, usually between 4 to 6 p.m. So that time is very, very busy. If it is during rush hour, then the travel time will be about 60 minutes as opposed to 30 minutes, okay? So if you were to look at this here, and on the right side is the actual code or the pseudocode for that. Okay, so we talked about these different types of data types in Python last time. So I'd say that the one in greens are the uh, primitive type, and then the blue or light blue over here are the reference type. And there is a huge, there's a distinction between the two. So I want to kind of show you what that is, uh, give you a little demo, and then we'll move on, okay? So that, be, because there is another um, operator that some students or some people tend to use, and you want actually you'll get an incorrect result. Okay, so here is, the primitive versus uh, reference type. Okay, so primitive type means like integer, floating numbers, uh, a boolean, and things like that. Okay, so for example, when we talk about reference uh, primitive type, the primitive value um, will look something like um, let's just say num one or num equals uh, two. Let's let's put num one, and we'll put another one here, num two. Okay. Oh, by the way, you can do this, or in Python, because it's so flexible, you can also initialize your value like this. I showed you last time, one. And then if they are both the same, I showed you last time, num1 equals num2 equals 12, right? So that's another approach you can do. Or you can also do this, num1, num2 is equal to 12 and 20, like that. Okay, so that means that, you know, the position here has to match. So 12 goes to n1. 20 goes to M2, okay? So there are a lot of ways that you can initialize your data in Python, very flexible. Um, so some people, this is, may not be, you know, a, as useful, but a lot of people will use this approach. And if you see that, that's what that means, okay? So I'm just throwing that out there for you, just in case if you see it. But I'll, I'll do this approach so it's, it's easier to, for us to see. Okay, so num1 and num2, um, <clears throat> there is a, um, so when you when you check whether those two numbers are the same or not, uh, we'll look at the operator in just a minute. Okay, so there is a comparison operator, which is the double equal sign. So if I put here um, num1 equals equal num2, okay, if you print this out, right, like that, what you're gonna get is either a true or false, okay? True or false. So this is a um, comparison operator. The two equal signs here I'm comparing is, is num1 equal num2, the value of these two variables. And so if this is the case, then I'm gonna run it and you will see the output it says right here, it says true, okay? It's true here because they are indeed the same. Now, if I change one of these two, you know, 11, then of course, that is no longer true, you get a false. Right? Pretty typical how you compare two uh, uh, variables. So um, 
And, and why is it true? Is because the the reason why is how we use this operator here. Okay, this is called the equality operator. And there is another operator that some people will like to use, and it's called num1 is num2, like that. So the is operator is another one which is not very common, I guess, in this. Not, not in common in this way, but some people like to use it because it's like English sentence, right? It makes sense, right? Num1 is num2. So if I print both of those, you'll see that both should be false, right? Because they're not the same. So if I put back to 12, then I expect both to be true because they're indeed the same, okay? So this is true because the data type here for num1 and num2 are actually, if you look here, is a int type, which means they are primitive, right? So when you when you are comparing primitive data, you know either this or this um, is operator will work the same way. They're equal or not equal. Okay. Now, if I change this num1 and I wrap those both of those into a square bracket. Okay. Now, the square bracket here, we'll learn much later in chapter six, these are called lists, a list data type. A list is a reference type, right? If you look at the chart here, a list is a reference type. Same as tuple and set of dictionary, we'll do that later. So a reference type, as you can see, when we run the same statements up here, when I run it, you see that the first statement is true, but the second statement is not true, okay? So when you compare reference data type, the is operator will not give you what you expect. And the reason why is because when you're comparing reference data type, you are comparing the memory addresses as opposed to the value, okay? When you compare primitive types, or when you use the equal equal operator, you're comparing the value as opposed to the memory address, right? So that's one distinction. And I can show you here, uh, I can print, let's print the, the memory address of, of num1, okay? I put here, let's put here um, num1, so we can see the memory address. This is how you can actually this is not the actual main address, but it gives you an idea that the hex value of this uh, number, which is a related to a memory storage in your, in your computer, is, is either the same or not the same. Okay, so you put here num2. So it's a hex function, the ID of, of the variable here, and we'll give you that information. Okay, so when you run this statement, you're gonna see that the, the memory address for num1 is this and num2 is this. So they're not exactly the same, okay? So when you compare using the double equal sign, you are comparing the actual value, which is 12, that these two variables store. But when you use the is operator, you're comparing the memory addresses. So because the memory addresses are different, the value here is not compared using the is operator. Okay, so, so be careful when you do that, um, if you happen to um, Google somewhere and look for some answers and they'll use is or is not, um, just be careful that you are, you are comparing the memory addresses as opposed to the value, right? <clears throat> However, if you do this, if I'd say uh, num1, I mean num2 is equal to num1, okay? If I sign that, and you're gonna see that now the memory addresses are exactly the same. Okay, so in this case, both are true, right? Because with the reference type, what this one does is basically pointing its location to the same memory address as num1. So whatever, wherever num1 is, num2 is exactly that position. So the analogy of this is a like a bank account, right? Or a credit card account that you share your credit card 
uh, with another person, the family, and for how, however many credit cards you issue out, they're all pointing to the same account. So if you add money or use money out of that account, all the other values, people or card also affected. So what that means is if I change, if I change num one, um, we'll learn this later, from um, 12 to 100, okay? You're gonna see that the value up here for both num one and num two should also be changed to 100 as well. Even though I never touched num two, right? I changed num one's value from 12 to 100. This is the assign operator. Again, we'll look at this in, in chapter six. I'm just showing you that because they share the same memory address, num two's value also changed to 100 automatically. Okay, so that is the difference between the two uh, types. And, and so because of that, I do want to uh, warn you that try not to use the is in your program. Okay, so what that what that means is like if you were to do this in a program like this, if these are the if statements, if num one is equal to num two, then you print like uh, yes, for example, else print no. Okay. So if I run this program, it should print. Um, and so, I mean, let's go back to, to this example here, put uh, 12 here like that, right? So in this case, it should be yes, because they are indeed equal. Okay, so you can see down here is yes. If you change that to something else like 11, then of course that would be no. Okay, if you put back to 12, and if you use the is instead, then you're gonna get no, in regardless of what you have inside here. So it will always be no, okay? because the memory address will never be the same. Okay, so just watch out for that side effect. Um, just because it's convenient to write, it doesn't mean you're gonna get, give, the, give you the result that you wanted. Okay, so with that said, let's look at um, the if statements. Now in Python, let's go a new one over here. We'll look at the decision. So a decision in Python is using the if statements, okay? So if like that, and you have a condition here, so let's go back to, um, let's do it this way. Um, and I just put n1 here. n1 is uh, 10, and then n2 is uh, you know 20, right? So when you compare, this is the if statements followed by the expression. The expression here will be a comparison if n1. So when you do the decision, again, you do some type of operation, okay? The operation here will always result to what's called a true Z or false Z value. That means that the condition, whether you have a single condition or you have a compound conditions, we have you know a lot of conditions to test in there, the end result will always be a single true or false, okay? So in this case, if I say if N is greater than N2, if that is true, Okay, it will always test for true, okay? It, it, so the first if statements here, then followed by a colon. This colon here uh, represents a code block. Okay, I briefly downloaded this last week, a code block, and this is the only time where you have to and where you can indent your code in Python, okay? You cannot just indent your code even a single space other than the comments, right? We, we learned that last time. So this ID, it will automatically indent four spaces for you. If you don't have this option, then you can indent at least one space, but I recommend at least two or more, okay? It's easier to read. And then this is the true branch. I put a note here. This is always the true branch, okay? It cannot be the false branch. It's always the true branch, even though if I test uh, false equals false, right? Because the result will be true or whatever, right? So this is a true branch. And then 
if, if this is all you have to do, then let's say you do something here. You can say you put a message saying, and one is a uh, larger, like that. If that is all I need to do, then you end the program here. And then at the end, you will print another statement, maybe uh, end program. So you know that the program ends at that point. So I'm doing a single branch, uh, even though, I mean, you know, Kobe only shows single branch, really it'll always have two branch, two branches. So in this case, I'm only concerned about, about the true branch. I don't care about the false branch. So if you don't care about it, if you don't need to do anything about it, you can ignore that. So when I execute this statement, I should expect a false because n1 is indeed not less, not greater than n2. So I'm not going to see this statement, right? It's not true. So therefore, this will be skipped. And all I see is just the end program to print in the console over there. Okay? Because that is not true. However, if you change it around, if this is less than n2, now that is true because indeed that's true. We're going to see this printed. And then after this block, so from here to here, from this colon to the line 10 is the one block of code. After that, if there are no more statements, or if your statements is indented back to the other, back to, okay, if you do that, so be careful also, that means that both of these statements are a part of the if branch. Therefore, these two will only be printed if the value here is true. Otherwise, you won't see anything, right? So because the indentation here is important. So sometimes you have to be careful. And if you accidentally, in your code as well, maybe you unintentionally uh, put your line back to that position, then, this statement here is in the outer branch, right? And this is in the inner branch, okay? So that therefore, I don't recommend you write code this way. It's very confusing to see. We like clarity. So make sure you have at least one space or more, um, you know, for the next block of code or so. So you can clearly see the indentation here. If you look at indentation, again, Python is very beautiful, or right? you can easily see your code and where they fall and how they are executed. So in this case, you should see both statements being printed down here. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the, um, let me see if I can do that. So for that one, that is this symbol here, right? We have, we have a, a condition symbol like this. Okay, then we have a branch that is true. So you can do left or right, doesn't matter. You go one here, right? And you have the other one. You can say um, this is the other false branch, right? So we have this condition goes right in this box here. Okay, the, the data coming through this way. And then we test it here, is it a true or false? Okay, if it's true, then we will print a print function uh, function is this parallelogram. Okay, remember that. And then it's true. So this will be in right in here. That's the true branch. And then this is an outer outside of the if block. It's not part of the if block. So therefore, if this is false, then notice if it's false, we're going to go out here and print this statement. So this statement here is actually down here. So another uh, parallelogram, and this one here is actually right here, okay? And then down here, we end the program. So we start from here. And then, so notice after we print this line here, we still print the end program. So that means after this, I still have to go and print this one, okay? So if it's true, print this. And then after that, there's no more statements to run. Exit out of the, the if block and then print line 12. You do that down here. If this is not true, then we're going to skip this branch in here. We're going to go directly down to the end program and just print that out and we're done. Okay, so very simple one uh, where we do not process anything much in the else uh, block here.
All right. Okay, so now let's look at the other branch, the else branch. So, I mean, by default, the else branch is optional. If you don't want to do it, uh, use anything in that, you, you can ignore it. So the else branch would be, uh, make sure that they are aligned in the same column. If this belongs to that if, be careful because I'll show you, for example, if I have another if branch here, if, if true, for example, and if you happen to do that, okay, and um, I'll put something like, like that. So, so this branch here belongs to this if. If you do this, then this LC belongs to this inner if, okay? So be careful the indentation where this else clause is uh, being used, okay? So um, let's go back to... Before. So now we have the else clause, and you cannot leave it blank like that. Okay, you can't just do that. If you don't put anything there yet, maybe you haven't decided yet. What you can do in Python is you put the keyword pass. Okay, pass means like I'll come back to it later, so that you can continue executing your code without having write, to write any code. If you don't do that, it's not going to let you. So, for example, if I comment this out like this. Okay, you see this an error saying, hey, you have to have at least one statement in there, uh, excluding the comment. So again, if I'm not sure what I want to put in there here, I know that this is the structure I want, you can put the word pass in here, and you can come back to it, so you don't have to put any actual code in there, okay? So we, we know that that is the else clause. If that is not true, then we're going to go to the else branch. So the first else here is always the false branch, right? So what do we do here? Well, when we want to print another statement saying n1 is smaller, or I say n2 must be like is larger. So we have a two very basic statements. And then, because this is independent, right? It's not part of the uh, else clause or, or block, it's by itself. So you're gonna get either this or that, and this last line, right? It'll always be printed. So in this case, of course, we're going to see exactly the same thing. I did not change the design here yet. So it should still be the same as before and it's larger. Now, if I swap the sign, then now we're going to see that N2 is now larger because it's no longer true. So we love running the else or the false branch. So this is the false branch. So in this example, here you had exactly um, one branch for true, one branch for false, and only one of those will run. There will never be both. There will never be none either, right? One has to run or the other um, um, has to run. So if you do want to do something for the else clause, this is again, kind of like a processing part and you do that, right? <clears throat> Now, you also have the option of having multiple branches. Um, well, actually, you know, before you do multiple branches, let's do the nested branch or the nested if block, meaning you can nest other, nef, uh, other um, if statements inside other if statements, else statements. Because in, the, in here, between here up to line 12, 13 is one block of code. So you can treat this space here same as the entire space in the global space, right? So one block of a uh, code block, same thing here. From here all the way down to line 19 is actually, in this case, um, either, I can't tell, but either part of the else clause or the global um, block out here. So let's say inside here, if indeed, maybe let's go back to this one here. If N1 is less than N2, we know that N1 is larger, but I also want to see if N1 is positive, right, or negative, for example. So we can also do another check in here. So let's, let's do if N1, how do we check if it's a positive number? Very simple math, right? Greater than zero? More than zero. More than zero, okay, yeah. So if N1 is indeed uh, greater than zero, and we'll assume that, um, well, as soon as zero is, zero is also positive, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. So is greater or equal to zero. In that case, this is positive. 
So you can put notes here, a comments here. Then we have another branch where print and one is positive. Okay. So in this case, yeah, we're going to see, we should see this statement and also this statement. We're not going to see this, right? And there is no else clause inside here, as you can see. So we're going to see the AND program down here. So we have three statements over here. Okay, so we see the AND is larger indeed, and AND is actually indeed positive. What if we do a negative? And we'll put a negative 100 like that, right? So negative 100 is indeed less than a negative 20. Okay, so this will be true. So we print indeed. Um, no, that's I'm sorry, that's not right. Negative 10, right? So negative 10. No, that's not right. And two. Yeah, okay, let's 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 switch this around then. Let's switch the, the plus sign. So minus 10 is indeed larger than minus 20. That's true. So n1 is indeed larger. But when we get to this branch, right, it's no longer true because it's negative. So we're not going to see this. So we only see two statements like we had originally, kind of. You see the, that we only see the, the, the larger and the end program. So we did not include the other clause. So if you want to print a negative, then you have to do another else here, right? The else branch. And print here, and one is negative. So now we have a full if else statements nested inside the else branch. And then we can do the same thing for the other one. So we can copy that, put it over here. So now we have the other part when n2 is larger than we we'll say is n2 negative or positive. So we put that down here as well. Okay, so I have two nested ifs inside uh, another if and else clause. So when you when you run the code, write the code, you have to trace your code, right? Trace it and follow the flow line. Um, and then where it ends when you have no more statements to run. And then of course, based on the indentation of, indentation of your code as well. So in this case, if I change this operator around to a negative, I mean less than. So we're going to go to the else, the outer else. We call this is the outer if. This is the inner if is inside, and then the outer else as opposed to the inner else. Okay. So this is not true. We're going to skip everything here, jump to the else clause, and then we'll run this branch. So n2 is larger. Uh, in this case, um, actually, is it true? Not true. n2 is larger, less than n1. It is, this is not true. Um, it's actually small, right? Um, I mean, I mean the, the wording is not correct. It's actually uh, smaller. A little bit weird. Uh, so forget about what I type here. It doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, it, it is. It is smaller. It doesn't matter in this case. But we're going to see that it's going to be a, a negative or positive down here as well. So I'm just showing you the the branches that it goes to. Okay, when you deal with this type of scenario. So again, be careful when you do the else clause. If you happen to do that, and if you happen to like and then this like that. And so now all of these belong to that single branch and you expect to run these, but they, you're not gonna get the result. In this case, you're gonna get only a single statement because there is no else clause to run because this is not true, right? So be, be careful when you write your code this way. And sometimes in this case is what's called a logic error, right? When you debug it because it, Everything is correct. It's just the output is not correct. So logic error is very time consuming to fix.
right. <clears throat> so going back, um, all right, so now we have the if and the else. Now, when you when you test something like this, when this is when you are just testing for um, two a single operation like this, whether this is true or not, is you can use if and then the else right away. You don't have to retest test it again. Okay, so for example, let me um, uh, move it down here. Okay, let, let's let's move it down here. Uh, actually, let me copy this and I'll do another one. It's confusing, so let's do that one here again. So again, I'm doing the same thing. I say if if n one, and, and let's go back to positive number. We'll just do a very simple one. If n one is um, less than n2, it would print, um, I just put here n1 larger, actually uh, be n2, yeah, n2 larger, or oh, that's n1 larger, okay? So the else part, you can, you can also, sometimes you can also do this, but you don't have to, else, and then at the else clause, some people might, want to check it again, so you can do it if n1 and two is greater than n1, it's redundant, okay? What I'm showing here is redundant. Okay, so this is redundant because I'm repeating myself because I don't need to check it again, right? We know for sure if this is not true, then it will have to be this one already. So therefore you don't have to check if it's true again, okay? It's just extra code to write. Of course, it will produce the same result as the other one. And in this case, you can see that it is an um, wrong syntax. So the N2 is actually larger, that's true. Okay. So by doing this way, um, what you can do though, however, is if you can check this if N1 is larger than N2, if it's true, then you print that else, Maybe if you check something not related, then you have to check it, right? If if n one is uh, not larger than two, you go to else clause. Then what? Then what do you check? What else do you, do you want to check besides just comparing whether they are large or not? You can compare whether uh, n one is negative or positive. Maybe if you do that route, so you can say if n one is greater than zero, then we we'll say n one is positive, right? What else do you want to do? Okay, so that's true. And if you also want to say, well, if that is positive, then um, then you do that. Otherwise, you go back to your um, else clause, matching this one. If it's if it's not positive, maybe you also want to check to see if n1 is a, a prime number or divisible by, I don't know, two, an even number, right? If it's even number, you do that, okay? This is the even number. And we print okay. So you see that I have one condition if it's true, then I print that, I'm done, right? Program ends. If it's not true, then I go into test the next condition. So this case, back to the um, choices of, of operation you want to do. Choice one, I want to see if n is larger than two. If it is, then I end here. If it's not true, then the other choice is, is it a positive number? If so, then I print that and I'm done. If it is not positive, and I keep going to the next choice. Is it an even number? If so, I'm done. And if none or all the above are true, then the program ends, so print nothing, right? So in this case, if you run it, you're gonna see it, and we just get the point where n is, uh, actually, no, this is not true because um, uh, because of the else clause here, okay? I, I had it wrong. See, I already had like, a, an incorrect uh, a program 
Well, I guess no, that's fine because it, it stops here, right? It, it stops here, that's, that's fine. If I put, um, yeah, if you put a, uh, a number like a minus 10, like that, right? Then you're gonna get only one of these branches, right? So um, let's see if I do that, you see that and it is indeed even, but it is not larger than N2, it is not positive, but it is even, so you get one of those, okay? So this approach here is, as you can see, a little bit hard to read, hard to see. So instead of doing it this way, if I add one more uh, statements, you'll see it's gonna go further and further to the right. Again, it looks, it's nesting that way. So what Python came up with is, has a what's called the else if clause that you can join this together like this. It's not two words, by the way. So, I mean, they like short uh, words. So you have the call L if, okay? The L if here stands for the else and if clause so that you can make your code much nicer and easier to see as opposed to be all indented to the right and left. Okay. Do that and then And let's end up that way. Um, I'm not sure where that came from, but okay. So now, if you look at it, it's much easier to see. And they use the the L if, else if or L if here only when you want to test a different condition from the one above. I mean, not the reverse of it. If it's the reverse of it, it's again it's redundant. Okay, if it's reverse, you have you don't have to test it, but um, if indeed a different condition, then you can join those together using this approach. And so we join the um, if and else if and else if, and the very last we can also have another else clause. This is like the catch all. If none of the above is true, then it must be this one, right? If you have an else if, else if, you don't have an else statement, else clause, I mean, if none of these are true, then you then nothing gets run and you don't know whether they're true or not. So you can also use the else and then you can print here uh, none of the above, right? Something like that. So you know that something is happening and the other three did not catch it or something. Okay, so this is a very uh, common example. We have multiple branches or multiple choices in your conditions. In, in your program, is, is is this a student, right? Is this a regular employee or not? Yes. Um, if it's not, then is this person above forty? Yes or no? Is this um, a senior, right? So you can you can have all those different clauses go down there. So the order is important when you have a a collection or a list of if and else if here because you have to carefully replace them in a logical order, because if you do it correctly, then you may not get what you want, okay? I want to do an example that is coming from uh, one of the assignments uh, that we did in week one. So in this case, you can see, I should get the same result as before, and is in the even. And if I put like uh, 11, then none of the above should be true. I should get this statement here because I know that it's not true, this is not positive, and it's not divisible by two, and it must be the else clause, so you get the none of the above, okay? <clears throat> so notice, I mean, just for like, um, you know, indentation-wise, now each code block, they must be stored in the same indentation uh, space of indentation here. The next block, it doesn't matter. You could have, you know, like that. And this one here, you could have like, like that it doesn't matter, okay? So wherever you start, the next statement must also start on that same position. So I cannot go back and put another print here, okay? It, it's, it's incorrect. So they must all start from the very first statement, whichever it is, how many spaces you put, the indentation you have, the following statements must follow the same uh, uh, space. 
Okay. Again, the only with the only time where you get to indent forward is you have another code block. So the colon here represents a code block in Python. And I can't just do that either. Okay. Uh, you have to have a condition of some sort or another program or another will learn object later when we get another class or function. Okay, so again, it's you don't want to do that because it's kind of ugly already. So just resort to using the correct same number of indentations your code is much cleaner. <clears throat> All right. Um, are there any questions? Okay. So we are, I kind of cover already like the if and else, and then else if clause, and then and, and the inner uh, nested clause. Now you can also do this. Show you another one can also produce the same output. Is instead of joining these together like this. You can break them up, just if like that, okay? And then this would be the else clause. So I guess um, uh, this is a little bit um, different. So we'll leave that up for now, okay? Okay, so if I go back to a 10, so we can see. So in this case, you know, because only one if statements will, will be true in this case will be the uh, last one here because both of these are not true. So we go back to say n is even in this case. Okay. Right, I produce the same output as before, same result. <clears throat> so can anyone tell me what's the difference between this and what I had earlier with the LF? I have three, you know, block of code using the LF like that, right? So again, they produce the same output. It should be N is even as opposed to by themselves like this. Yeah, 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 right. They're, they're not nested into one the other, right? So, um, and, and they produce the same output, okay? So if I put, for example, if I put um, a, a positive 10, I'm gonna get this one, right? I'm gonna get, and it's positive and it's, and it's even because, but yeah, both these are true. So there's one difference there already, right? Okay. So I guess what I want to show you is that if you if you run it, if you type your code this way, that means each of these if block if statements will run independently. Okay. Yes, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So if, mm -hmm. that's correct. So if you if you don't chain them together using the L if clause, that means every condition will be tested. Every if block will be contest will be tested, and sometimes you want to do that. If if you're if you want want to do is basically to select one option out of these, then you want to use the else if because what happens is that only one of these branches will run, right? So in other words, if you have twenty of these, you don't want to go through every if condition and test those. It's redundant. If, if only one can be true, then just keep running down the list until you find the one is true and then ignore the rest of your code. So you don't have to spend extra CPU time calculating those extra if blocks. Okay. Yeah, it was skip. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you want to just skip it and then be done with it, move to the next um, process. Okay. So that is the difference between using an uh, independent if and then by themselves or with the LF. So this is more of a design um, pattern. Okay, so uh, here, here I give you a very simple example. 
if I go back to the other one over here, okay, so back to this um, nested branch. When you have a nested branch like this, <clears throat> when this is true, only when this is true will this run. Okay, if you have a, a situation like this, then what you can do is you can actually combine these together. Okay, so I'm gonna copy this, create a new one, so we can try this again. And I will just show you um, the first block here. I'll delete this. So when you have this kind of scenario, you don't have to have another else if if black in here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just remove that one of us or, or or not simple like that. If this is true, then I'm gonna test this to see if this is true. So in this scenario, what you get is what's called the end operator or a compound condition. So instead of doing it that way, I can combine both of those together right up here and join them with the word end. Okay, so it's now possible, it's saying, so this statement can be removed. I can remove this one and then put that over here. Okay, so that means that this has to be true and this has to be true as well. In this case, for both of these to be true. I mean, the logic is a little bit different how I print it in here, but I want both to be um, true. It, and one has to be larger and it has to be positive. In that case, then you can join those together like this, what's called a compound condition and using the and operator um, like that. So, so your code is shorter as opposed to having many if nested ifs in there. Okay. <clears throat> so both have to be true and then you've got to get that. So in this case, uh, and is indeed, uh, this is, this is not true. And then because it's not true already, it's false using the and operator. And with the and is that both have to be true, right? So if one of these is already false, it's going to skip the entire thing. Okay. Back to the truth table, right? So n one is not less than n two. So therefore it's already false. If I make that to be, um, a, a, a positive 10, then yeah, this is uh, it's not true either. Let's make it um, let's make it 20, 22. Yeah, it's not true either. So both of them would never be true, I guess. <laughs> the way I had it, because it's it's unless it's um unless it's positive like this. Back to that. Then this is fine, right? So this is true, and this is true, and therefore it and is. Now larger, but of course, um, it's smaller now. So, so you get a smaller positive end program. So I'm just showing you the end operator here, comparing uh, this one first and then this one. So it's going to compare from left to right. So if this is true, then only then will the next condition be tested. If this is not true, then the next block doesn't need to be calculated. So behind the scene, which you don't get to see, Python will not spend CPU time to calculate this part. Okay, so this is called sometimes called the, uh, the short circuit operator, like back to a circuitry, right? So you are shorting it because you would basically, I don't need to check this because there's only, there's only one false. Everything will be false anyway. Okay, as opposed to the or, or means that if this is true already, then I can ignore the rest. I don't care what the others are because as, as long as one of them is true, the entire thing is true, right? But if this is false, if this is false, then because I'm using or, I have to check the next one. If this is false also, I keep going if I have more to check until the end of that. Well, until you find one true result, and then you will go to that branch. And so that is the difference between the and and the or. <clears throat> so again, be careful which one you, you put first because that is gonna take precedence in your in the program. Okay. Okay, I think it's a good time to stop for a 10 minute break. We'll come back at nine o'clock and we'll continue on 
Now, I, I wanted to um, spend with the next uh, session to do some exercises from the book. So um, we'll continue. We'll come back from break. So I'll see you nine o'clock. <laughs> All right. So now uh, let's see if we can um, spend the rest of the hour to do some exercises. Okay. Um, also, I want to, uh, if you look at the notes in my notes, so I can give you an idea, uh, where is it at? So we here, in this notes here, my notes, I added a, um, a diagram towards the bottom of, of these. Um, so I, again, I have some extra notes in here that may not be applicable to this course, but I do want to show you anyway. So when you do the operations, um, make sure that you're using the word and as opposed to the ampersand here for the and or in the exclusive or, okay? Because these behave differently. These are called, a, um, these are the binary and the binary or as opposed to the keyword and and or. So if you uh, do A and B, what happens is you're actually comparing the, the bits of the binary number as opposed to the actual value of your 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 um variable. So be careful when you do that. If you are from like Python, I mean um Java or JavaScript background, you may be you know more familiar with the uh, double ampersand and double uh, pipe symbol here. But Python doesn't have uh, the two ampersands and things like that. Just the word for the end. So again, just some operators here. Um, down here. I don't know if I have a note on. Yeah, so this diagram is going to show you what a nested if statements or condition will might look like in a float chart. So you have like different layer or levels of nested blocks in here. And, you know, they can be pretty deep down. So as you can see, it's much harder to draw in this case than to actually write pseudocode. So again, this is like the trade off between writing pseudocode and flow chart. Um, but it does give you a nice visual of what what's happening, but it takes a lot of time to you know construct. Um, but nonetheless, if it's easier to see things, then you know uh, you have to probably choose this approach. Okay. Right. So um, I have let me see. I have I, I pulled out a few exercises from the book, like. Uh, for example, we can try a few of these very simple ones. Uh, we can try the first one, right? Very simple. It says to, and, and let me let me copy this, okay? And then I'll put it to the um, spider so we can run that in here. Put up here so we can see. So you're going to write a program, <clears throat> all right? <clears throat> contains a number, x and y, and to set y to x if x is positive and to zero otherwise, okay? So a very basic question, very simple one, but um, if you don't understand what it's asking of you, sometimes you can have the wrong program, wrong code, right? So um, the first thing is you have to understand what is asking of you and what kind of output you need to, to um, produce. So this case doesn't say much about output, but it's expecting us to just print uh, the value of y, right? Why is it, is it um, x or is it zero? So in this case, we're gonna read the output. <clears throat> Um, okay, so the input again, put here. It's easier to do things in a sequential order like this and put notes in here so you can see which part belongs to which part. I always kind of do like to do this so you can see it easily. So, what's the input here? Right, so the input is we're going to read x and y. I mean, we're going to read x, yeah, x only, right? Because we don't care about y. Y will be either zero or x based on that condition, right? 
So initially, I'm going to, um, even way before the input, we already know y. So y could either be uh, x or 0. So if you just write it straight out, so the output, I know what it is. So output will be simple, print y, right? y is, and then put here y. And I don't have y yet, so I will create y up here. Eventually, I will. So let's do the input. So we'll print the input into x. And we'll put input. Remember the input function? If we enter uh, x like that. So very simple, right? You read one value. And then the process is to decide whether y is equal to 0 or y is equal to x. So how would I do here? What do I need to do here? <laughs> so we'll test here, right? We'll test using the if condition. Just, just like what it says here, if x is positive, and we kind of did, did this last time. So if x is positive. So again, don't use is zero or greater than zero, okay? So as x is positive, and we're assuming that um, I guess positive would be not zero in this case, right? Because y is going to be zero if it's not positive. So we'll assume that zero is indeed positive. But I guess it doesn't matter because y is going to be zero anyway. Okay. If that is true, then we're going to say y is not equal to x, right? If it's not true, then we set to zero. So the, this is the else clause, okay? So the else clause. Because in this case, we care about y, right? Whether y is x or y is 0. So this is a very simple one. You can see how I can do that. And when you run this, it's going to ask you over here on the prompt. And if I enter a 9, then I expect y to be 9, right? Except I got an error, OK? So again, if you get this type of error, I, I told you last time that you have a lot of errors in your code and you will spend a lot of time debugging. And this is one of them because actually, oh, I forgot because you cannot compare uh, a number against a string, right? Remember every data coming in from the console to the computer to program is always gonna be a string. So you cannot compare a value against a string. If you, if you put a, a string of zero, then yeah, that's fine because now comparing string against string, we kind of looked this uh, last week as well. So the type you're comparing must be of the same type. Okay, so if I do this way, the ASCII value of, of whatever X is, is a string, compare that against the ASCII value of zero, then now I can do that because it'll work as opposed to the other one, it did not work. Um, one more thing also I wanna show you is that notice how to run this program. I still have my old values variables up here. Okay, I don't want these to be in here because if I do, and if I do some extra code or sample code on here, I can have some uh, incorrect error because I think the program here actually, it may, and I, it doesn't not, it may have some kind of interference with the uh, value in RAM here. So what you wanna do is if you go to settings, I think it's in settings, let's see if it shows up. Under the, um, uh, let's see, where is it at? Oh, I don't remember where. There's a place, if, if I can find out, I'll find it next time. There's a place that asks you to um, check a little box to clear the entire um memory every time you run forgot which one oh run yeah under the run here <clears throat> and i want you to um select this box something about 
remove all the variables before execution. Okay, if you check this box and just apply OK. So now when you run the program, it's going to clear this automatically and it will add only the, the variables that you have in this program. Okay, so now it's much easier to see than before. So you put here nine again. Okay, so it only retains what I currently ran in my program. I supposed to retain everything before. Okay, so you can see that now it works, right? Because I'm comparing of the same type. So if you were doing a number like this, then I told you that you have to convert this to an integer first. So you can do it like this, x is equal to int x, a comparing integer as opposed to uh, a, um, a float. So now I'll compare numbers. So it still still be true, okay? When you do something like this, you know for sure that you're expecting a number you can wrap this input inside here because this is in the x, right? It's like it's like math. So x is that, and x is in here. So therefore, this is x, right? So you put that in here, like that. And then I remove this, so you can see that now I have two things in the ones. I basically kill two birds with one stone, right? That, that like the saying goes, okay? Because it will execution will um, start from the inner parentheses out, you go, you're going out from the inner out most. So I read first and then I convert that and I assign that to X in the one go. So, so I mean, this is fine, but don't do this, okay? I'm not saying you cannot, you can. Some people will actually do this. Okay, if X is two, then I can put X here, right? And then I don't need this one here, okay? You can see how flexible this can get, but then it's confusing because you know we don't want to do it that way. Okay, so um, so this is good. Convert it right away, so I don't have to convert again in the future. And this part here, if this is true, then y is x. Otherwise, y is zero. If it's not true, right? If it's not true, let's say if I put it a minus seven, y will be zero, right? So in this case, it doesn't matter what this is. So if I do this, if I move this and put it above here, I initialize it to be zero. So you can see I ignore my else clause, okay? Because I initialize y to be zero, that is the default value the only time I will change y from zero is if x is indeed a positive number, right? If that's the case, then now y is replaced and then it will execute down here and I'll get the correct result. So I save myself two lines of code. I mean, one extra line of code, basically, the else clause. So this is a very common uh, pattern or coding style. If you know that regardless of what you what happened down here, y has to be something, then what is that default value be? Is it true? Is it false? Is it 100? Um, you know, because the only time that will change if a condition is set down here to modify it. So this way, you know, you save yourself a little bit, um, a few bytes of, of uh, character in your, your file. Right, so that was pretty simple, right? Okay, just don't forget a conversion. Um, let's do the next one. This one here is basically asking you to write a program to read an integer, okay, we do want integer only, and prints how many digits the number has. <laughs> and I give you some hint here. Checking whether the number is greater or equal to 10, equal or greater to 100, and so on. Assuming it's less than 10 billion, we don't do too much. If the number is negative, then you multiply by negative one to make it positive, right? So we only deal with uh, positive values. So this is like a condition, a, a validation part where it doesn't matter a user enters a negative or positive number, we always force it to be a positive number. 
So you have to take this into account as part of the requirement in a program. Uh, you can't actually ignore that, right? So same as you reading a spec to build something, you have to read everything and make sure they meet all the criteria. And it said um, the order of if statement is important here. You give some hint here. Okay, so let's copy this into our program. And now we'll do this one. Okay, so again, input. The reason I keep doing this is because you want to output everything only at the end. You don't want to go and process output, process output as you go. We don't want we don't want to do that. Okay, unless you have to produce some kind of error, then that's fine. But don't print the result here. Process everything, save it to variables, and then print at the end. So it's very clean and uh, restructured. Okay, so the output is of course we're going to print the number of digits for that number, right? So I can put something like this, print a number of digits. And then I'll put something, and we'll put a variable right here. Okay. So we just look for one number. So we'll just get the input first. I put here just um, num. Again, we want to be integer, so we convert right away. Okay, and then read the input. We enter a positive number. We put, we ask that from the user. And in later program, you can force a user to enter a positive number when we learn about loops. Okay, but in this case, we ask, we ask that, but of course, people always want to go the opposite way, right? And we'll accept it anyway. So enter a number, and then it says, if the number is negative, we want to multiply by negative one, okay? Even though this, you know, this statement comes at the end of this exercise, you have to read everything, make sure, okay, which one should occur first? That's why I put a note saying that the, the structure, the if block is important, okay? So if it's a negative, then we want to do that first, okay? We don't want to calculate negative values, basically. So the process is actually down here now. We don't, the input is very simple. <clears throat> so we check for a negative number. Okay, so we say if num is indeed negative, less than zero, right? If, if it's negative, then we want to um, multiply by one, negative one, right? So num multiply by one, right? Minus. Oh, minus one, yes, sorry, good catch. So n times minus one assigned back to n, basically. Okay, so this is the same thing as saying num is equal to num times minus one, okay? So the shortcut we learned last time. And then that's it. So we don't have the else, we don't need the else clause because it's either positive or already be forced to be positive. That's the first process. And then now we go ahead and then figure this out. So this part here, how many digits does the number have is the algorithm you have to design. So it has, a, 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 and there are you know many, many approaches to this problem, this type of problem, of course. So what will be a, a solution to this? If I enter 10, then it's a two digit. If I enter you know, 89, it's still a two digit. How do we figure that? Any thoughts? Minus 100. Minus 100? Yes. Well, I mean, if it's a minus 100, then we'd be forced to be 100. So we don't have negative numbers. But the number of digits would still be, if it's a if it's a hundred, then you have three digits, right? One zero zero has three digits. If it's a right, so so how do we how do we know if the user enter like 
a number like that. How do we know how many digits is that? Yeah, there's a length, there's a length function. Okay. So you can use that length function, but I cannot do length of one, two, three. Yeah, you can check. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, that's good. Right, that's why I say a lot of approaches. Right, so absolutely, yeah, you can you can convert to string, and then use a the length function, and and do that, right? Because because if if I do this, then of uh, one two three four, I'm gonna get that four digit back, right? So yeah, absolutely. Um, oops. So you get a little four, yeah. Okay, you can do that. Or because um, the reason why we have to do this convert to integer is because if it's a negative number, we have to convert it to a positive number. And then after that, because it's now a, a number, like your, your approach is to convert to convert to a string, right? Yeah. So what, so you can do <laughs> No, that's, that's right. I mean, lots of ways, right? That's why it's so, it's so um, fun. Mm -hmm. So we say a number is convert that back to string. So now it's a string. And then we can do the, the size or equals, um, well, I guess digits, equals the length of num. OK? And then finally, we print down here. You can say a number of digits um, is, uh, put a comma on here, okay. digits. So yeah, that's one approach, absolutely. And we'll see if it's correct. Enter a number, enter um, 12. I expect that to be two, and it is two. It's good. If I enter uh, 9999, that's four, so we get four. Perfect. Okay. So that's one approach. <clears throat> what else can you do? What's another approach? So again, this is uh, um, algorithm, right? So this part here, this one works because, and Python in some languages have these functions that you can convert, right? But some programs may not have you give you that option. It doesn't have the uh, these the conversions. So if it's if it just numbers, how would you do it, right? So um, another approach would be. Well, um, you could say, you could think of this way. I mean, this, this example gave you a clue here. <clears throat> if the number is greater or equal to 10 or 100 and so forth, right? So you can think like anything below 10 is one digit. It doesn't matter which one. Anything uh, between 10 and 99 is two digit, right? And if from 100 to 999 is three digits and so forth. So you have that range as well, but you're going to have more if statements to do that. Okay. So that's another approach you can do. Um, so this part is, is good, good mm -hmm. as is. So we'll, we'll comment this up for now and we'll do the other approach. This one here. Uh, and, you know, by doing this way, then you don't have to use the if and else statements. Since this chapter is about is if and else, <laughs> what do with the if and else, okay? So you can say that if the number is less than 10, right? Then we say digit is two, right? And then else if, else if number is less, is less than, 100, actually, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Good catch. Yes. Thank you. So be two. And then you can, you can keep going, right? I'm just going to stop here. And then we just is three. Okay. 
So you can see how this logic is also work. If I go up to like 999, it's going to be three digits. If I put anything in between, like uh, you know, one, two, three, oops, over here, it's still going to be three because it falls into that um, that range. So if you put a, a 20, a 35, you get two. Okay, so that's another approach using numbers uh, without doing any conversion. Okay, yeah. So if you go up to like a, a million, a billion, that lines of code will grow really huge. But later when, you, when we learn loops, you're going to see that it's actually much shorter. It can do this in two or three lines of code, up to any number, right? But now that's, so this is like the very basic, um, one of the basic algorithms that you can do, you can do. So this is one approach, you can do that. Was another approach we think. Another approach you can do is using the uh, very powerful operator in Python, the double slashes. Okay, so if you if you have a time to review, for example, if you do something like this, but do um, like uh, let's see if this works. So if I do a ten divided by um, for example, divided by 10, I get a 1.0. That's a decimal value. If I do a 10, the two slashes of 10, I get a one, <clears throat> right? If I do a 100 divided by 10, I get a 10 and so forth. So this, this operator here is quite powerful um, to do some of these operations. So one of the exercises that you did in the assignments it asked you to how many denomination oh, types of denominations can go into the hundred dollar and fifty bill and twenty dollar bills and so forth here. Okay. So uh, for example, if I ask you if I enter a one hundred twenty five, how many you know a hundred dollar bill can I go into that amount? Is you can do that if I divide divide one hundred dollar bill, I can only fit one hundred one single dollar hundred dollar bill, right? Okay. If I put like um, six like that, if I do that, I get I'm, I'm going to get five dollar bills. So not a very very powerful operator to do that as well. And if you want to know, okay, so how many how many twenty dollar bills can go into five six eight five six eight here? I put here twenty, I can get twenty eight twenty dollar bills. Okay. So another approach you can do here is a little bit. Um, I'm just showing you like different way how to um, do this. See, see if this works. Another approach <clears throat> using this operator. Okay, so we know that and is that already. So what we can do is I'll start. Um, so initially we'll put here the digits is defaulted to one, right? So regardless, you're gonna get at least one. The, the smallest digit you can get is one, right? Between zero and nine. So that is the default. And then I read my number and uh, whatever the number is, it initially was N. So I could do something like, um, maybe I put like a S or some for now, just to, for the sake. So S can be a num, divide by 10. And what you can do is that you keep doing you keep going down until um, s is actually hmm, zero maybe I'm not sure. So so if 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 I do that, Let's say if 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 it's like uh, uh you know uh twenty five right twenty five divided by uh ten so I'm gonna get two okay so the result is two so s is now two and then if I put two divided by ten again I get zero okay so I keep doing that until I get a zero basically so I say yeah so if s is not zero if S 
is not equal to zero. Okay, and I keep doing that approach. So I keep doing like S using itself is equal to S, right? Divided by 10. And then I count my digits by one. And then you keep going. So, so basically you're gonna end up this block on the, so again, it's not, it may not be the best approach by showing you that by doing this way, <clears throat> we'll see this works. I'm gonna just go to three, three, three layers here and see what happens. So if I enter like a 25, right? I get two digits because at that point, you know, when I reach here, you know, S is only zero, so I get a two. If I do a um, 125, I got a three digit. Okay, so you can see this approach also works, right? It, it's a little bit more like math, but these operators are actually quite powerful when um, when you use it in, in the right manner. So I can see there's a, a, a lot of ways to do this um, approach program, which is, Quite fun, right? In programming, like this map. And again, later when you learn loops, you can just basically uh, use these two lines, and then you can solve the problem with one additional loop structure. Okay? Because if the number is really huge, then I have to keep going, keep going until, like, like the answer question says, up to a billion, right? Ten billion. Then that's quite long, but. Right? Just show you the, the if and else uh, structure here. <clears throat> the way I did here, I kind of, you see, it's like I'm nesting this in here, which I don't have to, because if this is true, then I update my S and update my digits. So this could actually go back, you know, over here, and it should still be fine. Okay. So I, I think that should, should still be okay. Because basically I update this. And if S is only zero, then none of these will, will run like we did earlier, right? As opposed to uh, nesting this together. I just, I gotta have a, a lot of repeated code. That's what we, when next chapter we learn about loops, it's so important to you know, avoid this type of program. Okay, but if you don't know, then yeah, you have to keep going until you find it. Okay. All right. So that was um, kind of interesting and fun. And this one here, I, I guess we can skip this one here. You can try that one. Uh, letter grade. I want to try this. Let's try this if nested one. This is a like a board game, right? A chessboard or checkerboard. The program is each square of the chessboard can be described by a letter in a number, like columns A through H and rows um, one through eight, I guess. And so I guess you want to find out, um, I don't have the pseudocode here, I guess. But how do you know if I land in a, you know, a spot like G5, like uh, row column G, row five, this block here, how do I know if that is a gray or white? Basically the color of that position. How would you write a program so that I can pick any spot in here and it will tell me, you know, gray or white or black or white? What do you think, what kind of algorithm would you come up with to solve this problem? Okay. Again, lots of ways, right? <laughs> lots of ways. Um, so what do you think would be a solution to this? So, so we asked the user to enter 
um, you know, like for example, G5. So we assume that A through H and then one through eight only. So if I enter G5, and then what is that color of that cell? So how would you determine? So right, so before you write any code, you have to come up with an algorithm, right? How do I figure if I land in an E6, what is that, right? And of course, this is a this is a much simpler program, but um, because the the checkerboard is very really structured, right? It's it follows a single pattern, a common pattern. So if you if you look at the pattern, you see that all the diagonal all the diagonals are either all white or all black. If you look at each row, you see that it's alternating, right? White, black, white, black, white, black. Same thing with the row. So if you study this diagram, you see that, hmm, right? A8 is white. Okay, A7 is black. A6 is white. And so you can see that for column A, all the positive numbers are white, right? They're all, I mean, not positive, I mean, all the even numbers are white. The odd numbers are black for A. And then B is the opposite of that, right? But then you see that, okay, well, A and C and E and G are the same. And then B, D, F, and H are the same. So now you have some idea, right? So if the first number, the first letter is an A, then, ah, okay, I have some option to choose. Then the next is the digit. If that digit is the positive number, I don't care which one of these is, if it's a, I mean, if it's an even number, then the, the color is indeed white. If it's odd, then it must be black. And that is same, it's also true for C, E, and G. So now you say, you, okay, well, if it's A, a C, E, or G, then check the, the number. If the number is even, then it's gotta be white. Otherwise it's black. Okay, so that's one, one way of uh, approaching this, uh, this solution, right? So by looking at that, and then you can write it into, I guess, pseudocode and uh, a flow chart if you want to. So we can, you know, say that, so if the row, or if, the, if, if um, let's say if the first letter is a, is a, um, a, C, E, or G, right? If it's that group, I'm using like Python syntax, then now we check the number, right? So if the second letter or second character, how, <clears throat> because when you do this, you can read it as a, as a, the entire thing as a character, right? One approach. A second character is, or I guess um, the second, or I could just say if the digit, if the digit is even, then, right, color is white. Otherwise, color is black. I guess that was solved for the columns A, E, F, A, C, E, and G, right? Else, this is the outer else. In this case, I don't have to specify again, else if it's B, D, F, G. It's, that's already the other approach. The other ones already, so it must be one of the other ones. So I don't care 
to specify them in here. It's the else clause already, right? And then now I have all I have to do again is just test for the net for the digit, right? So if the digit for that case, in this case is the opposite. If it's if you look at B, if it's uh, even, then it's black, and then the other is white. So basically the reverse of that. Okay, else is white. So that is a um, pseudocode for this one. Okay, so you want to get a pseudocode. Now you can go and write Python code. All right. So so design the algorithm first, and then test it. So we can quickly copy this, and let's go to Spider and see if this thing works I'll put right here. <clears throat> okay, but one more time here, we can just basically re uh, reword this. So first the input, okay, I put here um, uh, cell, I put here input, enter a cell, so, so we know. And we're going to treat it as a string. So we can grab the first position and then the second position of the string. We're assuming that's going to be two, two characters, OK? So if the first letter is A, C, G, or E, so I'll put here. So the first letter, in this case, would be cell of 0, OK? Remember, it's a zero-based language. So if I enter a G5, then the first is the letter G. If the letter G is indeed a letter A, and I can't just do this, okay? B, A, C, E, I can't do that. You have to do, uh, you have to use the whole thing. If, the, if that is that, we could for cell of zero is equal to C, right? Or cell zero is equal to uh, E, and then one more or cell of zero is equal to G. So I have the entire uh, list there. If that is true, then go ahead and do the next one. Now I get the second digit. So if the cell of one is divisible by uh, two, right, I mean, uh, mod two is equal to zero, it is positive. But remember it is a string, so you have to convert it to an integer. And you can do that right away in one go like this, just convert that into int, and then convert first, right? And then divide that by two. If it's zero, that is positive. If it's positive, then we'll set the color to white. Otherwise, color is black. And then this is the else clause for the other one. If that's the case, then down here, I basically kind of repeat this again. But I switch the other one. It's going to be black and white. Okay. And then finally, what, what, what I, I'll put here, we'll print uh, the color. And so basically, this is the processor. So I can see processing is much longer than the input. Okay. So this is case sensitive also. If I enter a capital A, it's not going to work. I'm just going give to uh, give you that right away. So we'll see if this one runs. So I put G5. <clears throat> G5 is black. Is it true? G5 is indeed black. That's to a C6. It's white, right? So C6, white. So it's working. But again, if I enter a capital C6, then it gives me a black. Hmm, right? Okay, it's a correct. 
So you have to be careful when you compare these, okay? You have to convert it to either all uppercase or lowercase, or sometimes if you do the hard way, you have to do this. And it's really, really tedious for equals capital A. Yeah, and you can see it's a lot to do. You don't want to do that, okay? So what you do is you convert it. You force it to be either uppercase or lowercase. Uh, when you read this, you can do something like this. Convert everything to, um, uh, I think, is it upper? I don't remember. At the end, maybe upper like that. Okay. If you, yeah, you, you attach this whole thing, meaning read that input, and then convert that to uppercase. If you want the lowercase, you call the lower function. Okay, it's a function that attached to this property and then you convert. So in this case, it doesn't matter what the case is, it's gonna be a lowercase. If that's the case, then I compare all my values against the lowercase only, I can ignore the uppercase. Okay, I can choose one. So now if I do again with a C6, capital C, it should, it should be white as before, okay? So that's one um, approach. Now I'll do one more I'll show you before we take uh, this block here. You can also do this by using what's called the in operator, similar to um, uh, SQL, SQL. You could say if C, if the cell in C1 is in um, these numbers like A, B, Actually, it's C, D, e, and G. Okay, you can also do that. Again, it's a much, uh, it's a shortcut. This has to be in here. I mean, it has to match one of these. So again, we'll do a G5. Okay, so that also makes the code a bit shorter. So the n operator compares this value on the left against a list of, in this case, a char a characters. I'm using here is a list. We will learn that in chapter six. Or you can also do is you compare that in a string as well. So it's a substring of these. A, C, E, G. Okay, it also works because is this, this is a type of container data. So it will compare against each character in that list of characters. So if it's if it's an A, C, E, G, then that will be true. In this case, if I put C6, I get a white, as before, okay? So that way, it's much shorter than doing a bunch of ors up here. So this is indeed an or. Okay, good night, and I will see you all next week.